If I wax off into outer space, please put a rocket up my bottom. <laughs> my name is John Doran and I write about music. During this series for Noisy, I've been interviewing British musicians who are outliers and unique in their field, such as Brian Ferry, Gary Newman and Johnny Marr. Today I'm talking to John Lydon, who's helped change the face of popular music several times over. First as the front man of the Sex Pistols, he irrevocably altered pop culture, fashion and what it means to be a modern rock star. And then, more importantly, with Public Image Limited, he ushered in a whole new musical vocabulary, which rendered a lot of what had come before irrelevant. It's my absolute pleasure this afternoon to introduce Mr. John Lydon. Oh, hello. So, you live in the US and, you know, you come from proud Irish heritage. I wondered what, how you felt about me or us describing you as a British master. A British master? Hmm. That sounds like a golf pro. <laughs> Not that keen then. I view myself as British first and foremost. All right, okay. When my parents uh, gave up living in Ireland, they, they became intrinsically working class English and that's, uh, okay. and that's the way it is. So you don't consider yourself to be London Irish like some people? No, no, no. Proper London working class. Obviously, I'm, I'm talking to you now today because you've just come off um, a string of very successful dates with Pill and I you know, wanted to talk to you about how it's been going. I didn't get a chance to go to Glastonbury, so I wanted to ask you, did you manage to get off site without having even an accidental glimpse at either the Rolling Stones or Mumford and Sons? I didn't know Mumford Baron. Ugh. To me, that's like fake dodgy paddy outfits, you know? I mean, it's a little bit on the cornball side. But And the Stones, well, I, I seen about five minutes, we'll say, the night before in a hotel in Bristol, and, and I didn't like what I was seeing. It looked just silly. You know, but good luck to them. Let them do what they want. Uh, they're not my enemy. Over the years, Mick Jagger's done some actually nice things uh, in, in a, our direction, particularly with the early Pistols, when Sid was in a lot of trouble. You know, Mick was there secretly behind it, you know, the scenes, really like offering us lawyers and, and things, yeah. which we were incapable of getting together. So, you know, I, I won't have him knocked too much. Yeah, fair dues, fair dues. I was really touched to see the link between Nelson Mandela and Rise made more clear on the performance that I've seen on YouTube. Because I'm, I'm not sure yeah. how many people realise yeah. what that yeah. song's about. Yeah. So to me, Nelson Mandela is my people. His message is my message. One world, one race. Not us and them, but us, all of us. And, uh, and I've been doing that for a long, long time. Um, I think um, I'm watching all these various situations now evolve around the world. I th it's becoming clear we really don't need governments any much longer. We really don't. They can sort it out. I want to ask you about the roots of Pill. Just pretty much all the music I love went into Pill. Jazz fusion, noise, punk rock, disco, dub reggae. It's like everything that's righteous and good about music coming into one kind of horrifically powerful sound. They're not there directly, they're in indirectly. Yeah. Pill is a, a, an original thing unto itself completely and a lot of bad journalists made the fatal mistake of thinking that we were like uh, copying Cantago Mago or something or, or like they thought that in, with the pistols the accusation was that we were copying the Ramones I mean these are journalists who don't know music and don't know what they're talking about to say mm. such sillinesses the connection is in terms of individuality these were great, great individual bands and, and a great combination of individuals in, in, went into the making of their, of their ideas. And that's what Pill is, a combination of individuals. I wanted to talk to you about some of your maybe less lightly or more off the beaten track uh, collaborations. I'm just wondering, I can never quite get my head around why you cut all of Miles Davis's bit off the record. No, no, he's not on the record. I know, exactly, so why? No, no, he's, I didn't cut it, I just didn't want him on it. All oh, right. He said it best himself, he said, uh, he said, uh, oh, my trumpet lines, you're singing all my trumpet lines. I went, no, 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 Miles, you're trumpeting my singing lines. 
and, and for me there was every potential to work with him properly in the future. But I, I've got to tell you, when people like that quality walk into a studio, um, it terrifies you. It does. It catches yeah. up on you, you know, because you have such respect for them. How important was your trip in 78 to Jamaica? For Virgin, apparently very. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were involved in their frontline imprint, weren't you? Yeah. Now, what interests me is, is that I'm guessing that the, the Jamaica you saw and the Jamaica that Joni Mitchell saw and the Jamaica that The Clash saw were probably All different, very, very different. Very, yeah. very different. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I helped sign quite a few bands, but for me, my, my fun was, when I got bored with that, I run off with the Congos and, uh, and just hung out with them and just, uh, just lived that lifestyle for, for, you know, a little bit and loved it, loved it very, very much. So I got the impression that maybe the Clash, how can I put this politely, pissed their lemon-scented panties when they were over there? Well, I mean, what were they going there for? They, they have no um, background of multicultural you know, inheritance. I mean, they weren't brought up in the, uh, the council flats like we were. They, they don't know that, you know. They were like uh, coffee table boys, you know. Oh, let's go and earn some black friends and it'll be super. It went very bad for them very, very quickly because that, that got sussed, you know. that mm. They had no proper inheritance here to be indulging in this kind of music in. It was, um, it was again, it's, it's white boys trying to imitate you know, the black man music, just like uh, in the 60s, uh, uh, you know, all them uh, bands ripping off R&B, you know, it's not, it's not their stuff, you know, and, and that's the thing, and that's very hurtful, and to me, that's, that's racism, and uh, I don't mind telling them so. Talking about another influence, which is probably a bit more tangential, but still an influence on Pill as well, is disco. Ah, oh, love it, yeah. Love, love, in fact, I love all kinds of music, but of course I love a good dance, my God. Now, this brings me quite neatly to my favourite, favourite piece of cultural detritus or whatever to do with Pill, and it's the 10 minute footage of you playing on American Bandstand, which is probably one of the most glorious TV appearances ever, which it starts off as this shambolic thing of like, why a Pill play into these hundreds of screaming teeny boppers break dancers, electro boogaloo uh, people, miming. and miming. And yet by the end of it, everyone's uh, loving it. There's been a stage invasion and there's people yeah. breaking out these crazy dance moves. Yeah. To me, that kind of sums up yeah. the madness it, it, of it, it, Yeah, it was, a, it was their top uh, pop program. You could not and would not be allowed to play it live. Uh, a real serious, annoying challenge beforehand. But um, we got ourselves into such a good mood about it that we decided that we could really operate this really well and turn a fake mime into entertainment itself. It was great, great fun. I mean, we all just went off in our different directions and lovely, lovely stuff. I was watching the video to One Drop recently and obviously it opens with uh, some shots taken uh, around the corner from where I live actually, near Finsbury Park. I'm guessing your ties to the area must still be quite well, tight. Well, those are the flats uh, that I grew up from uh, 11 onwards. You can't give up on that. These are your folk. You grew up with them and they know you as much as you know them. And uh, it's, uh, it's that environment where you can't lie. Right? And, so, and so you thrive in it and, and, and you constantly search it out. Every time you come back to England, that's where you go because that's where you sort yourself out. You cannot explain us and that's what makes us. We are the ageless, we are teenagers. We are the focus out of the hopeless. We are the last chance, we are the last dance. I think, you know, maybe people have this perception of you as being kind of quite a curmudgeonly and angry and like very inhumane person, but I think, I think of you as being quite warm. And then you get that image mongering of the media, and of course Malcolm's poison pen in there, You're trying to like, you know, develop me into this like completely bad human being, which of course I went with because that's hilarious. I, you know, I thought, who on earth could believe a character like that could it possibly exist? But at the same but time... But somewhere in me, I've got to say, there is that, that, that little fella, that, that angry little rock, yeah, yeah. he is in there. You know, well, one of the greatest uh, problems for me is that 
I can't stop my brain thinking. And so on stage, there's 20, 10, 20, 30, 40 different things happening in, in, inside every single line. And it's, um, I can get completely carried away. Do you think it's weird that a lot of people whose kind of brains race around with loads of different ideas and like I know exactly the sort of person you're talking about, why is this type of people that are always attracted to drugs like speed and cocaine which almost exacerbate the problem? As Fear it of falling asleep and not waking up. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, that, that would be my dilemma. I went through that period, most definitely. Once you've been in a coma, you don't want to go back into one. And every, every night of falling asleep, you'll fight that off for years and years and years. How did you sidestep becoming a drug addict? Was it something that's befallen a hell of a lot? Because I come, from a, I come from a very smart community, you know, and everybody like looks out and will give you a bit of advice about the effects of certain things. Uh, knowledge is everything. Um, of course, I've got many friends that made completely stupid decisions, but and I miss them very much, but I went the other way. Is it all right if I ask you about Death Disco? Yeah, of course. This song originally was written while your mum was dying of cancer. As the song progresses and you get older and it accrues more meaning, like, you know, you lose your dad yeah. and other people who've been very close oh, to yes. you, does it become harder to perform? Well, and several friends in between too. So, so now performing it, it's not just about my mother. Of course, it's now about my father, Ariana of the Slits, my, my, you know, my stepdaughter, and, and a whole bunch of friends. And, and, and all of it starts to mingle in. And, and it, it's, it, it's really painful sometimes on stage doing that. But it's worth it for the results. It, it's like... Um, it's a self-analysis of what pain is, and I don't ever expect to find an answer for it, but I am constantly looking for a way to come to terms with grief, and that song is, is one of those ways. You strike me as a guy who is who he is. I don't think that I'm seeing too much stick on stage. That's just who you are. But at the same time, you've done a bit of acting. Does acting come into hated what it. you do? Hated it. Really? Hated it. Couldn't get round it at all. Couldn't couldn't be natural with written lines from somebody else's point of view. Did you not enjoy the experience of doing that film with Harvey Keitel, though? No. <laughs> you look genuinely annoyed when he puts his, your head in the oven. That seems great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now you pick up on that one, yes, because that had a sense of toughness and a realness, you know. What are you doing? No! Give me that, you fucking mutt. <laughs> I mean, I loved hanging out with Harvey. You know, he's a nutter. Uh, but he takes it a little too serious from time to time. And there was one moment on, um, in the filming where um, I didn't know at the time, but he was insisting, uh, because of his method acting, that he use a real gun with real bullets. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. Of course, uh, you know, I had a secret word with the staff yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah. But he actually pulled that fucking trigger. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so you've got to watch people. But Harvey's like that. He's completely dedicated to, 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 to acting. And, and he didn't know too much about me. He just thought, oh, another pop star trying to make a film. But um, when he started to come to the gigs, you know, and, and the first one was Roseland, I think, in New York City. He had a completely different attitude from there on. How did Kaitel came out to the Pill gigs? Yeah. Oh, nice. And uh, he realized what, what's really like uh, going on in my head. This is quite interesting, actually. I find it really fascinating that for a guy who, you know, if you believe the tabloids, was like, you know, people were actually talking about charging with you with treason because of, like, God save the Queen. And somebody who, you know, let's face it, took a few hidings and, like, were kind of like public enemy number one for a while. How much you are kind of loved by the public generally these days do you find you have to try and keep this notion of you being, for want of a better phrase, a national treasure? Um, <laughs> do, you, do you find you have to keep that at bay or keep it at arm's length? I am oblivious to that. That's, that's just uh, 
titles that are just bandied about and, and nothing actually at all to do with what it is I, I get on with in my daily life. Um, my sense of values are always community-led, always will be. Uh, and so they're not influenced by media manipulations. Um, for me, passive resistance is and always has been the way. Um, if I have any political hero, it would be Gandhi. I think that works. And when I say no governments, I, I really mean it. I'm not joking. I think we can sort this world out in a completely non-violent way. It leaves them all standing around like arseholes, basically. You can see in the temporary autonomous zones of things like raves, free festivals, you can see these systems of anarchy working, can't you? Yes, I can. I'm quite happy to say I'm part of that and have instigated an awful lot of these agendas. You know? I, I, I mean, every single one of these movements, I'm in there somewhere. Always have been, always will be. John, it's an absolute pleasure. Peace. Thanks very much. May the road rise and the enemies always be behind you. May they scatter, flutter, butter and shatter. A true star was here. <laughs> Thanks, John. Cheers. Peace.